It appears Elder Jim was dropped. Um, let's have a word of prayer. Kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to join here together. We thank you for um, your word and the knowledge that you have imparted for us during these last days. We pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit for each and every person represented here. We pray for the speaker um, who will be sharing your ways with us this morning. We also pray that Elder Jim will soon be reconnected back with us and we pray for this technology which we're using. Lord, we pray that this information will touch the hearts and minds of those who receive it and they will draw closer to you. This is our prayer this Sabbath day. In your precious holy name, thy will be done. Amen. 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 So there was a group who um, will be singing to that today. Is that group presently um, connected from Nairobi? Yes, I think I'm back on my, my mind decided to, there was a problem in my connection, but I'm here with the, if you can see, you would see that I'm coming in through another, another source, uh, okay, another screen. We have Technical University of Kenya, are you in? Technical University of Kenya, are you in? If they're not there, we have a testimony coming in from Georgia. Uh, Sister Lana, is the testimony in? Yes, I believe she's in. Dana. Dana, are you there? I'm here. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Great, 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 Dana. Uh, it's nice to hear from you. It's nice to see you after a long time. I think the last time we, we spoke was last year, was that? Yes, it was last year. Yes, and I, uh, I've been longing to hear from you and to see you. I know, I can see you're so excited. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm very excited because definitely God is blessed. Yes, 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 yes. Because I, 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 I can see that the Lord has been, uh, the Lord has been good to us. The Lord is a blessing to each one of us. Whenever we come in contact with with Jesus, we feel good and we know that the Lord is a healer. Uh, could you just tell us uh, where you're from? Where are you calling from? I am here in Georgia. This is where I was born and raised. And yeah, this is this is where I'm from today. So greetings from Georgia. I, is that Georgia, USA or Georgia, Russia? Uh, <laughs> Georgia, United States, the south of the okay. United States. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Just just close that to your bordering. Are you bordering Alabama? You're bordering Alabama. Yes, close to Alabama, close to Florida, the uh, Carolinas. And, uh, and Florida. Yeah, it, the sound cut off a little bit, but yes, around that area. Hello? Can yes, you hear hello? Me? Okay. Now, could you just, now, yes, last year, last year we, we had a contact in the, and uh, could you just share with people, we have, uh, we have uh, several people here from different continents, different countries, and <clears throat> they're here to, to listen to the word of the Lord and how the Lord is blessing through, uh, you know, doing healing. Uh, could you just share a little with us what your condition was and, and, and how you, you, you came out of it? Yes, yes. So ever since I was born, I had skin issues uh, by doctors. I was told it was eczema or atopic dermatitis, it had all kinds of names for it. I didn't know exactly what it, what it was, but I had 
severe rashes on the inside of my elbows and legs all over my face, my neck, different parts of my body. And I was struggling with it ever since I was born. And uh, the doctors prescribed steroid products, which worked for some time, but the rashes would come back and it got worse maybe like during my teenage years and then came back last year full fledged. And I wanted to try the natural way. And thankfully there was a church family, the coordinators who checked in on me and suggested that I speak to Elder Jim. And I'm just so grateful for just the cleansing that has happened because with these skin issues, not only is it physically uncomfortable, but mentally there's a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, nervousness. I'm not as confident or it's, it's kind of hard to look at myself in the mirror or to speak, speak to people. So it also messes with my mental health, but just working with the medical missionary ways and exercising as well, changing my diet completely in a ways that got more of my greens in, got more of my nutrients in, resting well and that and, and taking a hot foot bath and also hot tub. All of those things not only helped me feel better physically, but mentally as well. I had such a positive spirit and definitely was encouraged by what the Lord has given us to, to heal. And so I, I'm just truly thankful for that journey. It took some patience, <laughs> it took some time and some, and some steps, but it was definitely worth it and truly thankful for, for this ministry. So, so you're saying uh, that since you were born, you've had that condition. Yes, since I was born. And uh, I mean, if I, if I may just ask, I know it, it's not proper to be asking how old somebody is, but are you still a teenager or are you in the 20s or, or, or the 30s or are you in the 100s? <laughs> I'm 23. Oh, you're 23. So for yes. 23 years, you've had that condition and doctors kept on flipping this side and that side. It kept applying this and applying everything else, but it did not work. Did not work. So it only would do things temporarily. It would disappear, but it would come right back. But now just using this, uh, using the natural remedies, you've seen that <clears throat> something is coming up and working for you. Yes, it doesn't. Not only that, Amen. my skin feels better. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's wonderful. Powerful. Thank you so much. Uh, can we praise the Lord for that? Uh, yeah, those who are there, please just uh, unscreen yourself or unmute yourself and say a big amen. 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 And please feel amen. free. Feel free to uh, to uh, write in and, and share and, uh, you know, put in uh, whatever you want to put in on the chat group. Uh, talk to her. You can ask her contacts. If you if you know a person who has such a condition, please uh, make sure that you contact her. This is how we help each other, uh, because there may be somebody like that who is somewhere who may not have uh, uh, known what to do or how to do something. But you feel like that you, you want to know anything about it, please feel free to contact her. You can inbox her or you can screen, you know, whichever way. Uh, we wanted her to come in here so she can connect with everybody else. Thank you so much. Is the choir back in? Technical University, are you still there? Okay. Uh, if the choir is still missing, please... Uh, uh, we will go ahead and, uh, and invite uh, Dr. Muna. Dr. Muna uh, comes to us from, oh, Dr. Muna. Uh, Dr. Muna is originally from Zambia, born and raised up in Zambia, but he moved to, he moved to uh, Swaziland. I think he moved to Swaziland. And in Swaziland, uh, he's, uh, he's a citizen of Swaziland, but he works in South Africa. Uh, he's, he's, he's that connected. So he's a man who has uh, so many experiences here and there, experiences and experiences. Uh, and Dr. Muna is, is, is well educated. He's highly educated in different fields. He knows this, he knows his stuff. This is the kind of person we want to present before you today that you may know that uh, Dr. Muna uh, is, is 
knows what 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 he's doing uh dr mona are you there i am there sir thank you yes if there's anything else you want to share with us about yourself uh, or what you want us to know please uh, feel free to share with us and uh, if you want people to have your contact this is the place where you have people's contact because we we have people from all over the world who may want to know what you're doing who are suffering in many many ways they may not know what to do until and unless uh, until and unless you share with them and give them your contact or, you know, uh, whatever you want to do, uh, you're free to do that. Dr. Muna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Jim. I you, have, you have your time all the way to five minutes to, to time, and then you, you can summarize your stuff. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you very much, Elder Jim. I think you have definitely spoken much about me. I am a medical doctor specialized in obstetric and gyne. I'm also a public health practitioner. But beyond that, I am a very passionate medical missionary evangelist and worker. But my area of emphasis in medical missionary is on wellness. Um, I will say a few things about that in the slide that I'm going to share with you. But I think those who have listened to me, they have also gotten to that. So without wasting much time, let's go into our topic. And if you want to contact me, I think uh, we are all in this very group of med commissionary. You can always look for my name there and you can inbox me. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, in terms of my presentation, I think I will definitely give you seven things. I'll do an introduction, and then I will speak about understanding and wise use of the gift of childbirth. And then we'll talk about the female reproductive cycle, which is related to this childbirth. And then we'll talk about how you can modulate how you can postpone, how you can increase the chances of conception and childbirth. And then I'll talk about the natural methods that are recommended for you and then the advantages and we'll conclude. In terms of uh, introduction, I want to say, may God bless the medical missionary movement because of the effort they are making to provide what I would call basic essential knowledge dissemination. I, for a long, long time, I'm an old Seventh-day Adventist member. I Amen. really haven't, I really haven't had an exposure to information that can help me walk with God and do the right thing until I met the medical missionary movement. So I really want from the onset to say, don't miss out. These informations that you are allowed to listen to or to hear are very important because the world is full of information, but that's not the information God wants us to hear most of the time. Remember, this is the Sabbath. I would like really to say, God has always been speaking to us through the children of Israel that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You remember when the Israelites reached into Canaan, he, they were warned not to copy from the people they will find there because those people don't have any knowledge. But when the Israelites settled there, they started yearning for the knowledge, for the practices of those people. And God says to Hosea, tell them that they will be destroyed for lack of knowledge because they have rejected true knowledge and I will reject them. Let this never be said to us. And that's why we need to sit and listen to the fountain of knowledge from God because the world may have knowledge and we may be itching to read, to study, to understand that knowledge, just like the children of Israel. It may not be the knowledge God wants us. Sister White in the book Education also speaks about knowledge. He says, true education 
means more than pursuing a certain course of study. He, she says it has to do with the whole person. She says this whole person is, it is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. Now, brethren and sisters, this statement is full of information, but I don't know how many of you have really analyzed it. Sister White says true education relates to the development of the physical powers, the mental powers, and the spiritual powers. But I'm telling you, if you don't know what the physical nature and powers are, the mental nature and powers are, the spiritual nature and powers are, you cannot develop them harmoniously. And that's why we need to really seek information that helps us to have this harmonious development of these three important aspects. This is the part I would like again to come back to myself. Here in Swaziland and South Africa, we are running an institute, we call it Muna Health Life Institute. And this institute is, has developed a concept of health life. And this concept of health life says human beings are made of the spirit, the body, and the mind, SBM. This gives us what we call a biopsychospiritual framework of education, biopsychospiritual framework of education. We actually call this education the health life management sciences, which is total whole person well being. And Sister White talks about it and calls it the science of salvation. But remember, this is versus the science which is having a framework we call biopsychosocial. The world out there has a framework of education called biopsychosocial. And yet the Bible and the spiritual prophets really points us to have a bio psycho-spiritual framework. Now, this is called the science of salvation. And the other one, I would propose to you that the biopsychosocial framework of education is really the science of Babylon. Let me continue. This is just to really put you in the spiritual realm because this is the Sabbath that we really need when we seek knowledge to seek it to the right source. And I would recommend highly that the medical missionary movement has conducted wonderful basic essential knowledge throughout their existence. And even during this time of COVID, they have doubled that effort and we thank God for that. This is really the picture you should have in your basic education and in your self-development, the spirit, the body and the mind. And we as an institute here in Southern Africa, we are talking about health life, which is the center of the intersections of these components. The center of the intersection is the health life. Health life. The word health means well being. And well being in life is the harmonious development of the spiritual, the physical, and the mental. I leave you with that. And that is the basis upon which we are bringing these lessons to you. So today, we want to share with you a knowledge in the physical, because when you understand your physical well-being, you need to maintain it, you need to live a life that is in harmony with it. And this is why we are bringing this topic today, is to strengthen your knowledge of yourself, which is the body or the physical, and be able to maintain it in its highest frame, so that you can serve God better. Now, to understand or understanding uh, ourselves is also very important that we have got a gift of childbirth. We need to understand that within the physical well of being that it makes the component of us as human beings, there is this aspect of us where we reproduce where we have children and they have their own children. 
And we need to understand this aspect because God has given it to us as a gift, like our brother quoted in the first, that it is a mandate, it is a thing God has spoken to us to do, but we need to do it properly. There are three things our bodies, since we are talking of the body today, there are three things our bodies generally are built to do. Three things. These are is given to us to keep us in the wellness state. Now, let me also say a few things about this. You know, the world always thinks that health or well-being is only important if it's threatened by disease. Many people wake up to realize that they have a body they look they need to care for when they get sick. But let me tell you that within our institute, we have actually come to the understanding that human beings live or pass through three states. The first state we are born with and we should have continued to live in is the wellness state. The second state is the sickness state. When you lose your wellness, you go into the sickness state. If you lose all your wellness, 100%, you go into the death state. So we live into wellness state, sickness state, and death state. The body was given for us by God to keep us in this wellness state, but we cannot keep what we don't know. We need to understand this wellness state and live in harmony with it. And one of the things we are going to share today is how do you live in harmony with this wellness state of childbirth? Because childbirth, I'm a gynecologist myself. When women visit me, I don't call them patients. I call them clients because they are not sick. They are just coming to understand how they can live in wellness in the condition of childbearing. So we need to understand that. So the body is given for us to maintain us in the wellness state. We need to understand what this state is. I emphasize that because most of us, we only relate well-being or wellness state with sickness. We always say, don't be sick. Do this not to be sick. Do this. No, we should also be saying, do this to maintain your well-being, to maintain your wellness. The second thing the body was given is really to prevent sickness from coming in. Those who have studied the body, they will understand that it has already mechanisms within itself to make sure that you don't get sick. The challenge we have is that people don't know this. And so they live in against the body's way of being and therefore they invite sickness on themselves. And the third thing why the body or the physical health was given to us is to help us to reproduce. So today our topic is not in the wellness state or in the sickness state, it is in the reproduction. We have this thing called reproduction and we need to understand it. So this reproduction is really a miracle of fertilization, a miracle of embryonic growth. When the egg is fertilized, it grows. And then we have the child who gets born, childbirth. Women, by the way, have the potential of naturally being pregnant from 10 years to 49 years. Long time ago, when we were growing ourselves, women would reach menarche, would be able to bear a child completely maybe around 18 years. But today, because of the food, because of our lifestyle, even 10-year-old children are able to have another child with them or in them. So you can see the potential for a woman. 10 to 49 is almost 40 years or, or so. So I'm almost 30 years. So you can have children as a woman, but is that what God really wants that each one of us should have fed children? I doubt it. So God commanded Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply as we can read from Genesis chapter one, verse 28. However, he didn't command this to be done by one couple or to be done by us blindly. He created us as intelligent beings. We need to understand this gift and therefore use it wisely. We need to understand and use the gift of childbirth wisely. And that's why this information is very essential to be given 
to both the female and the male so that we can appreciate the gift God has given us and use it wisely. Let me therefore now talk about this state of being and, uh, and uh, let me just be sure that I don't, uh, yeah. I think, that, let me just go back because this one, yeah. So before I can continue, I would like to allow you to listen to this wonderful, wonderful gift of God in terms of how our body works to make this possible. Uh, in the world, they call it the menstrual cycle, but I would like to call it the reproductive cycle. So listen carefully. I'm, I don't want to overwhelm you with the information, but I just want you to appreciate the wonderful miracle of fertilization, the wonderful miracle of, of, of being able to have an embryo grow in you, and then, of course, the childbirth. So listen carefully to this because it's very, very uplifting because God says we are wonderfully and fearfully made. And let's see how this reproduction cycle works. Dr. Muna, could you pause it? We don't hear audio. Pardon? Yes, we can. We're not hearing the audio. Yeah, we didn't no. hear you. Maybe you have to review the last slide. All right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Let me just stop and go back. Okay. If you I go think... back to share screen. Yes, if you share screen, screen. Yes. And go back to share screen. There'll be a small button. In, yeah. in the lower left-hand side that okay. says share you, sound. You got it. Yeah, let me, let me just go to share screen and then say share sound, yeah. All right, we have done that now. Okay, okay. continue. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Sorry for that. Are you hearing now? No. no. Yeah, there's, there's a little screen. I mean, something that shows the uh, share sound from your computer. You are not hearing the sound even now? No. Okay, let me go back because actually I had done that. Yeah, all right, what is this? Did you get it? I got it. Let me just go back. Video changes in the activity of the ovary. Let me hear now. Are you hearing now? Learning medicine is hard work. Osmosis makes it easy. It takes your lectures and notes to create a personalized study plan with exclusive videos. Are you hearing now? 
Yes. Okay. Practice questions and flashcards and so much more. Try it free today. The menstrual cycle refers to the regular changes in the activity of the ovaries and the endometrium that make reproduction possible. The endometrium is a layer of tissue lining the inside of the uterus. This lining consists of a functional layer, which is subject to hormonal changes and is shed during menstruation, and a thin basal layer, which feeds the overlying functional layer. The menstrual cycle actually consists of two interconnected and synchronized processes. The ovarian cycle, which centers on the development of the ovarian follicles and ovulation, and the uterine or endometrial cycle, which centers on the way in which the functional endometrium thickens and sheds in response to ovarian activity. Menarche, which refers to the onset of the first menstrual period, usually occurs during early adolescence as part of puberty. Following menarche, the menstrual cycle recurs on a monthly basis, pausing only during pregnancy until a person reaches menopause, when her ovarian function declines and she stops having menstrual periods. The monthly menstrual cycle can vary in duration from 20 to 35 days, with an average of 28 days. Each menstrual cycle begins on the first day of menstruation, and this is usually referred to as day one of the cycle. Ovulation, or the release of the oocyte from the ovary, usually occurs 14 days before the first day of menstruation. In other words, 14 days before the next cycle begins. So for an average 28-day menstrual cycle, this means that there are usually 14 days leading up to ovulation, in other words, the pre-ovulatory phase, and 14 days following ovulation i.e. the post-ovulatory phase. During these two phases, the ovaries and the endometrium each undergo their own set of changes, which are separate but related. For the ovary, the two weeks leading up to ovulation is called the ovarian follicular phase, and this corresponds to the menstrual and proliferative phases of the endometrium. Similarly, the two weeks following ovulation is referred to as the ovarian luteal phase which also corresponds to the secretory phase of the endometrium. So let's first focus on the pre-ovulatory period, starting with the ovarian follicular phase. This phase starts on the first day of menstruation and represents weeks one and two of a four-week cycle. The whole menstrual cycle is controlled by the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, which are like the masterminds of reproduction. The hypothalamus is a part of the brain that secretes gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or GnRH, which causes the nearby anterior pituitary gland to release follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH, and luteinizing hormone, or LH. Before puberty, gonadotropin-releasing hormone is released at a steady rate, but once puberty hits, gonadotropin-releasing hormone is released in pulses, sometimes more and sometimes less. The frequency and magnitude of the gonadotropin-releasing hormone pulses determine how much follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone will be produced by the pituitary. These pituitary hormones control the maturation of the ovarian follicles, each of which is initially made up of an immature sex cell, or primary oocyte, surrounded by layers of theca and granulosa cells, the hormone-secreting cells of the ovary. Over the course of the follicular phase, these oocyte-containing groups of cells, or follicles, grow and compete for a chance at ovulation. During the first 10 days, theca cells develop receptors and bind luteinizing hormone, and in response, secrete large amounts of the hormone androstenedione, an androgen hormone. Similarly, granulosa cells develop receptors and bind follicle-stimulating hormone, and in response, produce the enzyme aromatase. Aromatase converts androstenedione from the theca cells into 17 beta estradiol, which is a member of the estrogen family. During days 10 through 14 of this phase, granulosa cells also begin to develop luteinizing hormone receptors, in addition to the follicle stimulating hormone receptors they already have. As the follicles grow and estrogen is released into the bloodstream, increased estrogen levels act as a negative feedback signal, 
telling the pituitary to secrete less follicle-stimulating hormone. As a result of decreased follicle-stimulating hormone production, some of the developing follicles in the ovary will stop growing, regress, and die off. The follicle that has the most follicle-stimulating hormone receptors, however, will continue to grow, becoming the dominant follicle that will eventually undergo ovulation. This dominant follicle continues to secrete estrogen, and the rising estrogen levels make the pituitary more responsive to the pulsatile action of gonadotropin-releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. As blood estrogen levels start to steadily climb higher and higher, the estrogen from the dominant follicle now becomes a... That is, it makes the pituitary secrete a whole lot of follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone in response to gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Urge of follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone usually happens a day or two before ovulation and is responsible for stimulating the rupture of the ovarian follicle and the release of the oocyte. You can think of it this way. For most of the follicular phase, the pituitary saves its energy. Then when it senses that the dominant follicle is ready for release, the pituitary uses all its energy to secrete enough follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone to induce ovulation. While the ovary is busy preparing an egg for ovulation, the uterus, meanwhile, is preparing the endometrium for implantation and maintenance of pregnancy. This process begins with the menstrual phase, which is when the old endometrial lining, or functional layer, from the previous cycle is shed and eliminated through the vagina, producing the bleeding pattern known as the menstrual period. The menstrual phase lasts an average of five days and is followed by the proliferative phase, during which high estrogen levels stimulate thickening of the endometrium, growth of the endometrial glands, and emergence of spiral arteries from the basal layer to feed the functional endometrium. Rising estrogen levels also help change the consistency of the cervical mucus, making it more hospitable to incoming sperm. The combined effects of this spike in estrogen on the uterus and cervix help to optimize the chance of fertilization which is highest between day 11 and day 15 of an average 28-day cycle. Following ovulation, the remnant of the ovarian follicle becomes the corpus luteum, which is made up of luteinized theca and granulosa cells, meaning that these cells have been exposed to the high luteinizing hormone levels that occurred just before ovulation. Luteinized theca cells keep secreting androstenedium, and the luteinized granulosa cells keep converting it to 17 beta estradiol, as before. However, luteinized granulosa cells also respond to the low luteinizing hormone concentrations that are present after ovulation by increasing the activity of cholesterol side chain cleavage enzyme, or P450SCC for short. This enzyme converts more cholesterol to pregnenolone, a progesterone precursor. So luteinized granulosa cells secrete more progesterone than estrogen during the luteal phase. Progesterone acts as a negative feedback signal on the pituitary, decreasing release of follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. At the same time, luteinized granulosa cells begin secreting inhibin, which similarly inhibits the pituitary gland from making follicle-stimulating hormone. Both of these processes result in a decline in estrogen levels, meaning that progesterone becomes a dominant hormone present during this phase of the cycle. Together with a decreased level of estrogen, the rising progesterone level signals that ovulation has occurred and helps make the endometrium receptive to the implantation of a fertilized gamete. Under the influence of progesterone, the uterus enters into the secretory phase of the endometrial cycle. During this time, spiral arteries continue to grow and the uterine glands begin to secrete more mucus. After day 15 of the cycle, the optimal window for fertilization begins to close. The cervical mucus starts to thicken and becomes less hospitable to the sperm. Over time, the corpus luteum gradually degenerates into the non-functional corpus albicans. The corpus albicans doesn't make hormones, so estrogen and progesterone levels slowly decrease. When progesterone reaches its lowest level, the spiral arteries collapse, and the functional layer of the endometrium prepares to shed through menstruation. 
This shedding marks the beginning of a new menstrual cycle and another opportunity for fertilization. All right, so as a quick recap, the menstrual cycle begins on the first day of menstruation. For an average 28-day menstrual cycle, the changes which occur in the ovary during the first 14 days are called the follicular phase. Ovulation usually occurs at day 14 as a result of the estrogen-induced surge in luteinizing hormone. The last 14 days of the cycle are the luteal phase, during which progesterone becomes the dominant hormone. While the length of the follicular phase can vary, the luteal phase almost always precedes the onset of menses by 14 days. The uterus also goes through its own set of changes. During the first 14 days of the cycle, the endometrium goes through the menstrual phase and the proliferative phase. During the last 14 days, it goes through the secretory phase. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was just to give you an understanding of the gift of, sorry, the gift of childbirth. And uh, all those wonderful cycles and wonderful arrows can only be summarized by saying the reproductive cycle is a cycle of preparing for the egg and preparing the womb where the egg will stay. And all those wonderful things that you have listened to the video do not take place on their own. They take place under the supervision of God through Christ Jesus and by the Holy Spirit. And we need to understand a bit of it so that we can cooperate with, with, with God. So what are contraceptions then which we can use to modulate, control, encourage, or prevent unnecessary conceptions whereby we do what God has told us to do and yet do it intelligently. Contraceptions are really things or method used to for birth control or pregnancy prevention. There are two types of contraceptions or contraceptives. Medical contraceptives, which means things which doctors, nurses, or pharmacies can give you. And then there are natural contraceptives or contraception methods, which you, using what God has given you in the body, can be able to cooperate with him and control your childbirth. Both of these types have, both of these types have many methods. The medical contraceptives or contraception or family planning as we usually sometimes call it, and the natural contraceptives or contraception or natural family planning has many methods under it. However, the medical contraception is not the best because it comes with side effects of the drugs or the things they are made of. Whereas the natural contraceptives, as I will say in the later slide, are very good because they are part of our wellness. They are part of what God has given us, as you saw it in this uh, video, that God has put wonderful, wonderful connections between the pituitary then the ovary, then the uterus. While the pituitary affects the ovary, the ovary's effect affects the womb. And the womb also affects the ovary in some way and the pituitary in another way. So you find it's a circle that works very well. But remember, don't be deceived. They are all under the guidance of God himself through his son, Jesus Christ, and by the Holy Spirit. But God wants us to actually work with him. So what are these natural contraceptives there for? Let me give you a list and I will go one by one, but briefly because we don't have much time. The natural method of birth control or natural family planning relies on understanding. That's why I gave you that video, just to see that you need to understand a bit of that. It relies on understanding and observations of the woman's reproductive cycle, which they call menstrual cycle, reproductive cycle. And remember, this reproductive cycle 
is a cycle that takes place in the ovary and in the womb, in the uterus. So it's both an ovarian cycle and a menstrual cycle. Menstrual refers to the womb, but the ovarian refers to the ovary. So what are the types of natural method of controlling childbirth? We have one called the calendar rhythm method. We have one called the basal body temperature method, the cervical mucus method, which is the Billings method. We have the hormonal monitoring method. You remember all those hormones you were reading? You can isolate one hormone and follow it up. Then you have the symptothermal method, symptothermal method, which means symptoms and then the temperature together. Then you have got the withdrawal method, which they call coitus interrupters. And then we have the abstinence method. These are the, uh, the seven natural method of family planning or natural contraception. Let's go on each one of it so that I just give you glimpses. The, uh, the calendar rhythm method relies on a woman's fertile period on the calendar. You remember, if you listen to the video, it says there is a period when a woman is fertile 14 days before a next period. 14 days before your next period is the days when you gave an egg and when a woman would be pregnant. So you can always use a calendar to take up that method. How do you do it? You can get a history of 12 previous menstrual cycles as your basic information. So if you are a young lady planning to marry, you can start recording your menstrual cycle almost for a year. And then after that, you can subtract the shortest cycle. You subtract 18 days. That determines your first fatal day in your cycle. And then you can look at one of your longest menstrual cycle in that group of menstrual cycles you have recorded. And to the longest menstrual cycle, you can subtract 11 days. That gives you your last fatal days. So between your first fatal day and your last fatal day, you can always now calculate the total number of days during which you may ovulate. And therefore, if you want to be pregnant, you can increase your meeting with your partner, your husband at that time. If you don't want to be pregnant, you avoid those days. This is the calendar rhythm method. In fact, in standard day method, one to seven, is an infertile. When you have just started to menstruate, one day of your menstruation after the seventh day after that, or whether you have stopped at the third day, those are your infertile period or infertile days. Eight to 19 days to 19, those are your fertile days. And then 20 to the next period, those are your infertile days. So this gives you just a picture of what would come after you do what I've just said above. The calendar rhythm method is about 80% effective when done very well and when used only alone, 80%, quite a very good uh, effectiveness there. Then we have got the basal body, uh, body basal method, which actually uh, basal body temperature method is based upon the fact that a woman's temperature drops 12 to 24 hours before an egg is released. So before your egg releases, your temperature slightly goes down by about uh, 0.5 Celsius. So if you are using a very sensitive thermometer, you can actually notice that your temperature suddenly has gone down. And then you can know that you are about 12 to about uh, 24 hours before you ovulate. And then you can also start to avoid to meet or at least increase the meeting, whichever your decision is. So the temperature, very every morning before getting up, you can take it, and this must be done every month. And then you can also use calculators. There are some calculators which are variable, or you can actually in, put it into, into a computer. To use the basal body temperature method, you should refrain from having sexual intercourse from the time the temperature drops until at least 48 hours or 72 hours, which is two to three days after the temperature has again increased from its lowering. So this method really looks at the fact that your body temperature goes down a day or so before you ovulate. And if you are taking daily temperatures, you can 
actually identify that day and avoid to either expose yourself to a pregnancy if you are preventing or expose yourself for a pregnancy if you are looking for being pregnant. The third method is the cervical mucus method, the Billings method. This method is very important because in China, it is the method that the government encourages people to do. It has a very small history, which I would like you to kind of listen to it, and then we can come back to it and say what it is. So to talk to us a little bit about the Billings ovulation method, I have Ms. Jackie Alemani and Ms. Pauline Phelps. So good morning, ladies, and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Thank um, you. Let, let's start to give people a little understanding of what the Billings ovulation method is. Okay. Well, back in the 1950s, um, couples were, well, having lots of babies because it was baby moon time. And <laughs> what that happened is um, some were being a little bit irresponsible and they were abandoning children on the streets and that kind of thing. So Dr. Billings was approached um, by couples to find something other than the rhythm method, which is a natural method of family planning. Mm -hmm. And um, because the rhythm method wasn't working for them. So Dr. Billings identified a, a very a very clear way of identifying fertility so that couples could either plan to achieve or postpone or avoid a pregnancy, right? And it worked very well. In fact, now we have Many studies done on the Billings method is the most studied method of family planning. Mm -hmm. And it's, they found that it's been 99% effective and so effective in, in postponing pregnancy that it's in the healthcare system in China. And do, do you think we should have something like that here to, to probably educate people more about the Billings ovulation method? Well, of course, I think, um, well, Pauline does as best as she can, mm -hmm. but it's a natural method. And I think that's the most welcoming part of it. It empowers a woman to understand her health, not only, you know, your arm hurting or you have a headache, but your reproductive health. And that is very important. This is the complicated process. Oh, no, I don't how, think How do you find out? What, what, what goes into, into finding out? What we use is our, the mucus as a biomarker. Mm -hmm. So any woman's reproductive system. So she monitors herself and then she can tell or understand how her reproductive system is working, whether she sees signs that there is a concern, whether she should go to the doctor, and then that knowledge also helps her with her birth, controlling her birth or space in her kids. And, and the main thing is it, it's natural. It's natural. It's you observing your signs, your reproductive health, and each woman is different. So it's not like the rhythm method where you say, okay, this is your cycle. It's going to be like this. No, this is each person is unique. Each person understands their own self mm -hmm. and that's how it works. In, in Trinidad and Tobago, we have, we, we have always heard stories and, and, and seen people uh, with, with large families, uh, especially in poorer communities, uh, people mm -hmm. who probably aren't as educated as, as some, they would probably end up with five, six children, and then you hear them asking for help. Right. This can help in, yes, in preventing things like that. Definitely. We have a wonderful story of a lady named Teresa. She had like 12 or 13 children and it came because her husband used to get drunk and they could have another child. But in any event, what happened is she found out with the Billings method, she found out what it was about and she knew when she was fertile. So when he came home drunk, she left the house. But it's not that she didn't, she wasn't in love with her husband. She loved her husband. And what she did is she came back home the next morning and explained to him that, listen, we need to, so, you know. Yes. So the, the lady explained to the husband that, um, look, we need to be careful. We need to be careful. I realized that I'm fertile. And uh, if we met, I will be pregnant. And the husband was so happy that he respected her. And that was wonderful. So the billing method is very important because you understanding your mucus, the thick mucus, the thin mucus, you can determine when you are able to be pregnant. So we don't have much time. I would have given you another video of how the billing method is checked by women, but we don't have much time. Let me just rush, but you can start now these methods on your own. The, the other method really is the hormonal method where you can check the luteinizing hormone you can get a dipstick and be able to use it. You can put it in a computer. It can tell you which day. Then we have got the other method that really we need to be able to use, to be able to see whether the woman is able to, to do that and to check everything 
and to be able to solve that one. Watch your signs of ovulation and be able to understand that. The physical signs uh, of ovulation help, help you to learn when you ovulate. Our, our time so, is way spent. Yeah, sure. Let me just end this one. Thank you very much. Otherwise, your abstinence also is combined. So when you combine the method, the rhythm, the temperature, the mucus, the abstinence, you can be sure that you'll be able to naturally control your birth. So finally, yes. really, I want to, to be able to say that we need to work with God. We are wonderfully made and we can cooperate with him if we understand ourselves I, I very well. We, May God bless we can, you. We can extend uh, time next time uh, because I see there's still a lot to be done and our time is really up and way spent. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Muna, for coming in. Uh, we really enjoyed. We've already. We really enjoyed your time, and so uh, please accept uh, that we're coming. We have the next group coming in with a song. So uh, please, uh, Took, if you're there, please come in. Uh, the choir from Technical University. Are you in? Yes. Yes, I'm. I'm saying start. Just start singing. You have. You don't have any much time. Please just come in and just sing your song. That's the last one, and then we pray. No time to waste. Is this here? Took the choir, please just go ahead and start singing. It, no, you don't have time. <laughs> okay, I think if the choir is not in, we may uh, just have a word of prayer and then edit here because we have another meeting coming in. Uh, in our next meeting, we have uh, the daughters. There's a group of daughters. This is the, the young ladies from age uh, four to age 35. Uh, they always uh, meet to learn a lot in, uh, in uh, you know, in helping the ladies and el helping young ones know what to do naturally and also encouraging them in different ways. Otherwise, thank you so much. Uh, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord guide you and keep you posted uh, uh, as we continue with other things. Uh, just uh, right, for those who are looking in for the first time, please just know that uh, uh, every Sabbath morning at 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock,
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Technical University, uh, for that wonderful song. May the Lord bless you. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Lord God in heaven, precious Father, we thank you so much for being with us all days of our lives. We praise your holy name. May you be with us as we go different ways and continue with other programs. Until then, may you bless and guide each one. In Jesus' name we pray.